Thank you very much for that introduction. And I, I must begin by, by telling you how immensely honored I am by this invitation. I have very warm memories of my previous visit to Canterbury. It was just two years ago, actually. And I'm happy to be back among a, a wonderful group of anthropologists and, and other colleagues, and particularly today, to share the celebration of a rebuilt apartment. Um, yeah, as you know, and we've heard this is an occasion to honor the memory of Paul Sterling, who in 1965 founded the anthropology department here at the University of Kent. And, and like Robert, I've never had the opportunity to, to meet him. I'm not sure if he would have shared my general perspective on modernization and development, but I certainly would have shared his concerns, I think, about the injustices and disorientations that continue to be generated by these processes outside of the modern metropoles. Um, I've recently been involved in debates with so-called post-humanists about how to challenge the economic, political, and ecological absurdities of our contemporary world. It's easy for most of us to agree that the current trajectory of global society is a source of frustration, to say the least. And I don't think I need to burden you with statistics on rising inequality or the transgression of so-called planetary boundaries to amplify that frustration. When I encounter colleagues who claim not to share this sense of frustration, I start wondering how they intellectually and psychologically manage to live in such a state of denial. <laughs> but an equally tricky question is how we, as concerned anthropologists or academics in the human sciences in general, might pursue a genuinely critical or even, may I say, subversive position. I'm frequently amazed by the kinds of questions raised by anthropologists who are no doubt sincerely concerned about global inequality and sustainability. Just to give you an example, the listserv of the Political Ecology Society regularly announces an undergraduate six credit course offered by the University of Georgia called the Anthropology of Surfing. It is part of a program called Surfing and Sustainability political ecology in Costa Rica, and includes, according to the curriculum, the study of, quote, surf culture by learning to surf, unquote. <laughs> so political ecology can actually mean flying to Costa Rica to do some surfing. <laughs> uh, it, it is indeed tricky to be critical or subversive these days. A significant number of anthropologists today seem to want to turn their backs on modernity. For many of them, turning their back on modernity is an ontological term. It means identifying with the non-modern worldviews of the people who have hosted them during fieldwork. And there was a time when I too toyed with the idea that animism could show us a way out of modernity. But my position since many years now is that, unfortunately, there is no way to resurrect ontologies that have proven incapable, unfortunately, of resisting modernity. Our only hope is to understand in new ways what modernity is. And no matter how profoundly enlightening it may be to immerse ourselves in perspectives beyond the modern worldview. This is something that I think we shall never learn from our non-modern <laughs> others, who tend to become as attracted by, dependent on, and ultimately possessed by modernity as we are. We need to understand the cultural, economic, and ecological logic of the global processes that have brought us to this point, the so-called Anthropocene, which makes it feasible for David Wallace Wells to write four months ago in a major New York magazine 
a deeply unsettling but quite credible article titled The Uninhabitable Earth. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, the urgent challenges of the Anthropocene cry out for, some, for our serious attention beyond all the imaginative ideas and amazing peculiarities which preoccupy the post-humanists and the proponents of an ontological term. This does not mean immersing ourselves in mathematics. As I hope to show, there is a space between algebra and poetry, where language can be used transparently to communicate about the subtle interpenetration of factors deriving from features of nature and features of society. To understand what modernity is, let us consider an early 19th century coincidence that I don't think was a coincidence. I'm thinking of the simultaneous birth in the very same place of the idea and phenomenon of technology and the idea and phenomenon of economics. Ah, you will object. But technology and economics existed long before the early 19th century. And perhaps you will remind me of medieval water mills or even Paleolithic stone axes and of the pre-industrial economic doctrines of the mercantilists and the physiocrats. Yeah, but that is not what I mean by technology and economics. I mean the kinds of modern technology and economics that are contingent on a globalized market, like the steam engine used for producing cotton textiles for the Atlantic slave trade and like David Ricardo's concept of comparative advantage. There was a definite historical discontinuity in the early decades of the 19th century in terms of how technology and economics were perceived. We might even talk about the invention of these two fields as autonomous domains of thought and practice. The Industrial Revolution gave us a new concept of technology and classical economists, such as Ricardo, developed the basic vocabulary of economics. Both of these developments occurred in the core of a world empire of unprecedented scope and power. This, I maintain, was not a coincidence. What I think we need to understand in order to stand a chance of keeping the Earth inhabitable for our great-grandchildren is how these three phenomena are related. Technology, economics, and imperialism. What is the relation between the emergence of the disembedded economy and the emergence of a new and disembedded technological rationality? And how is the emergence of these new categories related to core periphery relations in the world system? And to address our current predicament, how are these questions <coughs> implicated in contemporary <coughs> debates about sustainability, global warming, and the Anthropocene? Even more fundamentally, how are they related to the issue of how we distinguish between nature and society? We often hear that global economic inequality is increasing. It has been increasing for centuries and continues to do so. But do we understand why? How should we go about conceptualizing the driving forces of increasing inequality? Is there something unequal or unfair about international trade? If so, we're not likely to get the answer from mainstream economists who tend to be eager supporters of free trade. As I said, their faith in free international trade can be traced to 19th century economic thought in the core of the British Empire, in particular Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage and decades later, the so-called marginalist revolution. The economic models developed at this time and significantly in this place focused on the mechanisms which determine market prices. 
In focusing on the operation of markets, the so-called neoclassical school of economics that was established in the 1870s definitively abandoned the concerns of some earlier economists with the material substance and the history of production of traded commodities. <coughs> From now on, mainstream economics was to be exclusively concerned with how much money commodities fetch on the market, rather than with how much labor, land, energy, or materials had been spent producing them. <coughs> While earlier schools had been concerned with the relation between economic value and material inputs in the production process, such as labor or land, such topics were completely abandoned with the marginalist revolution. The effect was a final detachment of economics from considerations of the biophysical metabolism of human societies. This detachment has been the source of a long-standing critique from heterodox economic perspectives, such as those of Marxism and ecological economics. The economic perspectives of Alfred Marshall and Karl Marx, although diametrically opposed, can both be traced to David Ricardo. The former focused on his modeling of market exchange, the latter on his conviction that the source of exchange value was human labor. What can we say about the biophysical metabolism of world society in our own time? <coughs> Statistics on modern world trade converted from monetary to biophysical metrics reveal net imports to the wealthiest core areas of the world system, the United States, European Union, and Japan, in the year 2007, totaling around 12.6 gigatons of raw material equivalents, 34 exajoules of embodied energy, 5.6 million square kilometers of embodied land and 247 million person year equivalents of embodied labor. As all three areas were net importers of all four resources, the statistics show that it was not simply a matter of specialization with different areas exchanging <coughs> different kinds of resources with each, with each other but of a net transfer of all four resources contributing to the accumulation of global technological infrastructure as a whole. This incontrovertible material asymmetry of the global economy appears to be of no concern whatsoever to mainstream economics. 200 years after Ricardo, economists continue to assert that free trade is good for everyone. The point I want to make is that the shift of theoretical perspective toward an increasing preoccupation with market equilibrium was not simply a disciplinary development occurring in a political and ideological vacuum, but a discursive rationalization of the material asymmetries of colonialism. It permitted the asymmetric resource flows of the British Empire to continue invisibly beyond the official end of colonialism. To this day, the vocabulary and theoretical assumptions of 19th century economic thought continue to legitimize the operation of the world market, even as increasing numbers of people are alarmed by its tendency to widen global inequalities and, no less significantly, to degrade the ecological conditions for human life. The title of the book I published last year is Global Magic. I want to explain how the topic of magic is relevant to these critical perspectives on economic history, sustainability, and global justice. There is a vast literature on magic in anthropology, but out of a great number of possible contributions, I shall just mention one, because it highlights, as well as any other, the essence of what we modern people tend to classify as magic. Drawing on the ethnology of colonial Indonesia, Margaret Wiener has shown that a criterion used by modern Europeans to dismiss something as magic 
is that its efficacy, or to use Bruno Latour's expression, its agency, is contingent on human consciousness. The Indonesian practice of guna-guna poisoning, once it was understood by the Dutch colonists as materially and physiologically harmless, could be dismissed as superstition, in the sense that it was dangerous only to people who <coughs> believed in its magic. Referring to Latour, Wiener confirms that modern Europeans tend to emphasize the divide between the material causality of nature and the cultural and psychological causality produced by society. While the former is inexorable and incontrovertible, the latter is contingent, constructed, and open to negotiation. Against the background of this basic distinction, of course, what is classified as nature and what is classified as society has very significant ideological repercussions. Phenomena classified as nature or natural are automatically understood by modern people as intrinsically uncontaminated by social or cultural processes. Although nature can be conquered and modified, it remains conceptually impenetrable and consequently exempt from critique. I have no problem with the idea of nature as analytically distinct from society, but a very real problem is that the social natural phenomenon of technology has been classified as belonging, that's belonging exclusively to nature. We shall return to this topic shortly. <coughs> Wiener's constructivist perspectives on magic and the questions she asks are somewhat different from mine, but her identification of the essence of a modern definition of magic confirms my own use of the concept. I must admit to sharing the modern and currently contested conviction that the distinction between subjective and objective <coughs> aspects of causality is significant. To exemplify, I have pointed to the difference in this respect between keys and coins. Both these little pieces of metal can be attributed with agency in the sense that they can open doors. <coughs> but keys do so because of their physical shape, while the ability of coins to do so is contingent on human consciousness, namely the beliefs of the doorman about their value. In conventional modern thought, then, keys could be classified as technological artifacts, while coins could be classified as magic. Indeed, Karl Marx referred to our belief in money as money fetishism, derived from a Portuguese word for sorcery, feitiço. The important thing to acknowledge here is that the delegation of agency to artifacts can be dependent on or independent of human consciousness. However, this is not a distinction that we are likely to encounter in actor network theory, the ontological term, or post-humanism in general, because this distinction presupposes a contrast between the subjective and the objective, which post-humanists tend to reject. And yet, I would argue, such a distinction is crucial to achieving the kind of deconstruction of the global techno-industrial system that many post-humanists would endorse. As I wrote in my recent book, quote, rather than championing a magical ontology that most of us have irrevocably lost, an anthropological approach is more usefully applied to exposing the unacknowledged magic of our own ontology. One of the central points of that book is that technology, the seemingly objective operation of increasingly complex physical artifacts, is contingent on economics. The subjectively constituted, socially constructed ratios by which the various components of technologies are made accessible to different social groups. This is what I mean by machine fetishism. 
the appearance of solid material objectivity obscures the arbitrary social exchange relations which make the machine possible for those who can afford it. Let us return to the deliberations of Bruno Latour. He and his fellow posthumanists appear to be finding themselves in a bit of a quandary these days. Now that it would be rather preposterous to represent the alarming facts of the Anthropocene as social constructions, as what Latour calls factitious, uh, or as the specific ontological perspective of earth system scientists. I definitely <coughs> do not agree with Latour that we should abandon the categories of nature and society, no more than we should abandon the categories of object and subject. But please note that the two distinctions do not coincide. As I have argued elsewhere, there are social objects and natural subjects. And although the posthumanists tend to approach the subject-object distinction as simply political, it is ultimately an ontological one. A cat may treat a mouse as an object, but ontologically, the mouse is a subject. <coughs> However, one of the important points that Latour has made is that there is a modern tendency to purify social, natural phenomena as belonging to either nature or society. This observation might help us approach current concerns with sustainability as well as my own argument on machine fetishism. Since the Industrial Revolution, Mainstream economists have believed that their models can account for economic progress without any consideration of nature. For two centuries, in other words, the market has been sequestered from nature. It is conceived as a purified social phenomenon. No wonder the economists are now unable to deal with the incapacity of modern society to stay within planetary boundaries. Climate change is one externality that I don't think even economists seriously believe can be <laughs> internalized in market prices. My argument on machine fetishism is the mirror image of this unwarranted purification. Since the Industrial Revolution, engineers have believed, like the rest of us, that technological progress can be understood without consideration of the structure of world society. For two centuries, the machine has been sequestered from society. It is conceived as revealed nature. No wonder technology continues to be very unevenly distributed in the world system. These one-dimensional perspectives on what we should understand as social natural processes of exchange and production are a consequence of how our thinking about economy and technology has been compartmentalized since the 19th century. The point of departure of this sequestration of economics from nature and technology from world society is that the natural components of technologies are translated into market prices that have little to do with their material substance. These market prices, representing societal exchange rates, determine the feasibility of a given technology. Yet that technology is understood primarily as the revelation of intrinsic features of nature. Thus, invisibly and insidiously, biophysical resources are first asymmetrically exchanged within a highly unequal world society, and then unevenly assembled into technologies as if the technologies were simply indices of the ingenious exploitation of nature through advanced engineering. This is the illusion of technological progress that has distorted our understanding of human environmental relations since the Industrial Revolution. I guess I should explain how I can find Latour's observations on purification helpful and significant 
while I'm simultaneously unpersuaded by his injunction to abandon the distinction between nature and society. Am I contradicting myself? I think not. To say that nature and society are intertwined in our bodies, our landscapes, our technologies, and in climate change, is not to say that there is no such thing as natural versus societal aspects of these phenomena. Analytical distinction is not the same thing as rigid ontological dualism. Also, Latour's many examples of the misleading implications of purification are all confined to concrete artifacts, specific technologies, and particular objects of scientific research. But the most compelling critique of purification is achieved by applying it at the abstract level of modern categories, such as the economy and technology. In other words, it's not the acknowledgement of the categories of nature and society that is problematic, but the wholesale classification of entire fields of inquiry as belonging to one of these domains, referring the study of exchange to an exclusively social domain and the study of production to an exclusively natural one. Much has been written on how the establishment, or more to the point, invention, of the categories of economy and technology were part and partial of the Industrial Revolution. From different vantage points, for instance, Karl Polanyi and Robert Heilbronner have discussed the emergence of the disembedded market economy as simultaneously a topic of discourse and a social practice. Parallel to this disembedding of economic rationality, there emerged in early industrial Europe a new and disembedded technological <coughs> rationality. Although there have been voluminous deliberations over the past two centuries on the societal, cultural, political, and ecological consequences of economic and technological change, through all this discourse, there has remained an almost <coughs> self-evident separation of economy and technology as distinct phenomena. This separation appears to reflect the obvious fact that economists and engineers deal with quite different things. <coughs> the separation of economy and technology concerns with flows of money on the one hand and with the harnessing and reorganization of matter and energy on the other, does indeed suggest a misguided distinction between the social and the natural. Karl Marx in the mid-19th century recognized that flows of socially constructed exchange values and of biophysical resources such as human labor power should be integrated into a single theoretical framework in order to reveal how increasing social inequalities were generated by the regular operation of the market economy. As argued also by a long line of early proponents of ecological economics, the new science of economics was too preoccupied with monetary flows and market equilibrium to acknowledge the physical dimension of human society. Both these categories of heterodox economists thus challenged the inclination of mainstream economists to disregard the material metabolism of society. To account for the simultaneous historical emergence of modern economic and technological rationality, I propose that the invisibility of nature in mainstream economic discourse is conducive to the invisibility of world society in mainstream engineering <coughs> science. The exclusion of biophysical aspects from economics is the basis for the modern kind of technological rationality for which considerations of material frugality are simply superfluous. What Aristotle called crematistics, the management of money, has made economics in its original sense, that is, economizing with substantive resources, obsolete. For instance, the economists' cost-benefit analysis do not reckon with biophysical resources such as energy, only with relative monetary prices. And this is why concerns with net energy, or EROI, I don't know if you're familiar with that concept, 
It's an acronym for Energy Return on Energy Investment. Remain incomprehensible for neoclassical economists. And it's also why the notion of technological progress for economists and engineers alike is quite compatible with diminishing returns on energy and other biophysical resources. Although depressing, this argument is not a conspiracy theory imputing malicious intentions to economists or engineers. It is an account of how the sequestration of nature from economics and of society from engineering has been able to maintain the illusion that technological systems are not founded on appropriation. Once the market is perceived as an arena for the flow of abstract exchange values, and the potential of engineering is perceived as defined by this market, the construction of labor-saving devices becomes simply a morally and politically neutral project of harnessing nature's sources of energy for the benefit of humankind. The fact that the inputs of uh, resources into labor-saving devices are made feasible by a given constellation of market prices, that is, terms of trade, is sequestered from the technicalities of engineering, so that engineering appears to its practitioners as completely detached from the global organization of society. <coughs> Not only are material asymmetries in exchange thus made invisible by the ostensibly neutral operation of market mechanisms, so is their significance for the feasibility of specific technological systems that rely on inputs purchased on the market. The crucial point I want to make is that modern globalized technologies do not simply represent politically neutral revelations of possibilities inherent in nature, as it were, but social natural machinations that are contingent on asymmetric transfers of resources in world society. In other words, modern technologies are not just products of engineering, viewed as innocent research into the physical regularities of the material world, but finally also of unequal societal relations of exchange. <coughs> For almost a hundred years, anthropologists have been intrigued by Marcel Mauss' observation that gift-giving among the pre-modern Mau pre Maori of New Zealand created ties between human souls because the gift itself was believed to have a soul that could, quote, exert a magical or religious hold over you. One of the questions, unquote, one of the questions I ask in Global Magic is what it actually means to say that modern people have dismissed this belief in the magical agency of objects. The distinction between the gift and the commodity has been a topic of discussion for generations of anthropologists. Whereas the magic of the gift is founded on the conflation of people and the products of their labor, the modern commodity is instead a result of the alienation of people and things. In the former case, things are represented as persons. In the latter, as Marx observed, relations between people assume the form of relations between things. Paradoxically, however, both conditions qualify as forms of fetishism. Whether perceived as metonymical extensions of their givers or as autonomous embodiments of abstract labor, the things with which we surround ourselves thus magically implicate social relations. The question we might ask ourselves is, if the modern dismissal as superstition of the magic prompted by failed reciprocity is really more justified than the belief that all concerns with reciprocity can be delegated to the market. For this is precisely the ideological function of the conviction that market prices guarantee <coughs> reciprocity. 
The anonymous and seemingly incontrovertible exchange rates on the market are supposed to liberate us from any moral qualms about the distant social and ecological repercussions of our transactions. As the Dark Mountain Manifesto puts it, the story of our civilization is, quote, the story of a people who believed for a long time that their actions did not have consequences. In, end of quote, in disembedding both exchange and production, economics and technology, from face-to-face -face social relations and close contact with the sources of human sustenance, Modern society gives our modern lifestyles an illusory aura of moral and political neutrality. The abandonment of superstitious beliefs in the magical agency of unreciprocated gifts has been perceived as progress, rationality, and enlightenment. But this new perception of commodities as detached from the social context of their production is conducive to another kind of magic. This modern magic is not about fearing personal <coughs> retribution through an intentional agency attributed to objects, but about ignoring the increasing extent to which our lifestyles have deleterious impacts on other people and global ecology, and the increasing likelihood of a major backlash. Whereas pre-modern magic was the source of an uncanny fear of personal, purposeful evil, modern magic imposes a disembedded, impersonal evil generated by our lifestyles, afflicting people and ecological contexts far beyond our horizons, and likely to generate a no less intangible but disembedded and impersonal retaliation. We must finally ask ourselves why it should be considered more rational and more enlightened to pretend that our market transactions have no moral implications than to allow our exchanges to burden our conscience as among the pre-modern Maori. In masquerading as reciprocity, as we have seen, the exchange ratios defined by the world market continue to direct net transfers of resources to core areas of the world system. And in masquerading as revealed nature, modern technologies <coughs> are able to continue to globally appropriate human time and natural space as if they were not contingent on unequal exchange. Since the Industrial Revolution, economic growth and technological progress have served as supremely efficacious strategies for displacing workloads and environmental burdens onto other people and other landscapes. Viewed as strategies to achieve such displacement, they belong to a category of societal arrangements that includes slavery and imperialism. One reason why the mainstream notion of technological progress has been so misleading is that the so-called industrial revolution and the very phenomenon of modern technology can be perceived at vastly different geographical scales. Anthropologists tend to be quite familiar with the fact that the world system looks different when viewed from a village in sub-Saharan Africa than when photographed by a satellite. The bird's eye view afforded by a global satellite image of nighttime lights is more conducive to a gestalt shift in our view of the role of technology in the world system than any amount of time spent interviewing engineers, stockbrokers, politicians, <coughs> factory workers, or even African villagers. The logic of total global dynamics is rarely apparent at the local level. A classical example is the cargo cults in early 20th century Melanesia, which to many anthropologists exemplified how local perceptions tend to be constrained by limited horizons. If we turn this inside back on European history, we might see 
one reason why the European understanding of technological progress in the early 19th century was so detached from considerations of American slave plantations and the deindustrialization of India. To this day, historians of technology tend to focus on the local conditions and repercussions of mechanization, whether British deliberations on the so-called machinery question, as it was called in the 19th century, uh, the fury of the machine-breaking Luddites, or the insidious capitalist incentives to mechanize. It is rare to find historians approaching technological progress as a local manifestation of a global process, although significant contributions in this direction have been made by some of the so-called New World historians, like André Gunder Frank, Jim Blout, Kenneth Pomerantz, Joseph Inikori, and a few others. A more general reason why the total logic of what I call the money-energy-technology complex has escaped us is the fragmentation of disciplinary perspectives. The economists' discussions about money tend to be completely detached from the physicists' discussions of energy and the engineers' discussions about technology. As a consequence, empirical revelations about ecologically unequal exchange or the political uh, rationale uh, of energy transitions are not permitted to contaminate our image of the nature of modern technology. Conversely, constructivist insights on so-called social technical systems are not in the least concerned with global metabolic asymmetries or with the perspectives of the New World historians on the accumulation of industrial technology in 19th century Britain. For instance, proponents of the material turn and the new mater materiality in the humanities and social scientists have probably never heard of the rigorous quantitative methods of material flow analysis. Their focus on the local phenomenology of material objects is completely detached from the alarming reports of the United Nations Environmental Program last year, which showed that rather than dematerializing, the material intensity of the global economy has been steadily increasing over the past decade. The historians and philosophers of technology and social technical systems seem completely uninterested in both money, energy, and material flows. Yet the biophysical metabolism of the world system is itself precisely a social technical system. Like the blind men trying to grasp the features of an elephant, Conventional academic disciplines are unable to grasp the logic by which the categories that organize our production and relations of exchange are propelling us toward what David Wallace Wells recently called an uninhabitable earth. There is indeed an elephant in the room, and it is called money. <coughs> the seemingly natural idea that everything on Earth is interchangeable. Rainforests, Coca-Cola, coral reefs, iPhones, human lives, video games. Although our global predicament is being blamed on every conceivable consequence of the operation of money, such as modernity, capitalism, <laughs> globalization, growth, technological progress, or interestingly, economic theory, critics of each of these various aspects of that predicament rarely trace its roots to the idea of money itself. Yet that is precisely where a critical anthropology of the Anthropocene might begin. The central paradox of the Anthropocene is that it to some suggest a rejection of human exceptionalism, as they call it, as if humans were just a species among others, while simultaneously underscoring our inevitable anthropocentrism. 
No other species could name a geological epoch after itself. No other species could have invented money. No other species could be transforming the planet as rapidly as we are. The predicament of the Anthropocene generates different existential coping strategies among different people. Bruno Latour, in a lecture two years ago that I attended, has observed that Lars von Trier's movie Melancholia illustrates the dynamics of this diversity. If we think of our existential options as arranged along a spectrum, the opposite endpoints would be Donald Trump's denial of climate change versus the creative rec resignation of the Dark Mountain Manifesto. In between is the eco-modernist optimism of the Breakthrough Institute toward Trump's end of the spectrum and the critical activism of the climate justice movement toward the other end. <coughs> And in the middle is the vast majority of human beings who must simply repress the whole issue in order to be able to go on with their lives, conducting business as usual. Common to just about everyone worrying about climate change, except the position exemplified by Dark Mountain, is a faith in technological solutions. History will tell whether it is the destiny of our species to march like lemmings quickly and blindly into oblivion, or whether it will be able to muster the kind of responsibility and restraint that would be required for it to consciously redesign the very idea that has made it master of the planet. I refer, of course, to money. That is our only hope. One of the paradoxes of our way of writing history is that we do not hesitate to account for the accomplishment of earlier civilizations like ancient China, Egypt, or Rome in terms of exploitative class relations and the appropriation of resources by a powerful minority. Yet we tend to tell ourselves that the accomplishment of modern industrial society over the past 250 years are not products of exploitation. We use quite neutral and benevolent words to describe these accomplishments like modernization, economic growth, industrialization, development, technological progress, and so on. Yet the increasingly obscene inequalities of the modern world far surpass those generated by earlier civilizations. As the anthropologist Maurice Gaudelier long ago proposed, it is incumbent on us to grasp how a given social system is able to represent unequal exchange as reciprocal. It is with this imperative in mind that we have every reason to scrutinize the cultural and ideological logic of general purpose money and globalized markets and its manifestations in unevenly distributed machinery. In experiencing the globalized technological infrastructures of urban life in the 21st century, the individual person is unable to conceive of them as anything but the all-powerful and immutable substance of human society itself, enormous in its extension and relentless in its expansion. So completely does it dwarf the individual human subject as to make any general critique of modern urbanism seem silly, verging on the psychotic. The sheer volume of resources mobilized in the metabolism of this globalized social organism is inconceivable for the individual preoccupied with managing his or her personal household concerns. Like the architecture of previous civilizations, the amphitheaters of Rome, or the pyramids of Egypt, for instance. The physical infrastructure of the modern metropole is intimidatingly greater and grander than a person's capacity to encompass it. Its complexity and monumentality cannot but 
command, submission. Yet this unimaginably massive metabolism hinges on the continuous throughput of flows of energy and materials that are ultimately quite vulnerable to disruption. So-called oil crises and electric blackouts are ubiquitously understood as temporary interruptions in the inexorable progress of high-tech society, rather than sources of serious doubts about its long-term resilience. Popular confidence in modern infrastructure is as essential to its operation as trust in the market economy with which it is intertwined. Let me recapitulate the basic outline of my argument. Rather than being intrinsically and generally flawed, the problem with the nature-society distinction is its skewed way of organizing our thinking regarding economics and technology. The fields of economics and engineering are ontological mirror images of each other. Mainstream neoclassical or marginalist economics tends to assume that a theoretical account of economic growth does not need to consider nature, while mainstream engineering tends to hold that a theoretical account of technological progress does not need to consider global society. Both these foundational modern assumptions are false, but I emphasize again that this is not to say that it is misleading to analytically distinguish between nature and society. What these assumptions accomplish, however, is to allow us to pretend that our Western, sorry, that our lifestyle, sorry, and consumption patterns have no tangible consequences for other people and ecosystems, and thus no problematic moral or political implications whatsoever. Moreover, the purification of economics as social and technology as natural has had implications for our relative readiness to subject them to critique. Economic organization, such as the market, has been open to serious political contestation throughout history, whereas critiques of technology, such as those of the machine-breaking Luddites, or later, the dystopian philosophies of uh, Louis Mumford, Martin Heidegger, or Jacques Ellul have been dismissed as romantic, regressive, or even ridiculous. Kirkpatrick Sale uh, tellingly titled his book on the early 19th century machine breakers, Rebels Against the Future, the Luddites and their war on the Industrial Revolution. The message is clear. To question technological progress is to try to halt something inevitable. The widespread leftist vision of a future post-capitalist society is based on our readiness to reorganize the economy, to be sure, but that vision continues to rely on an, on an unshakable faith in technology. There is little awareness of the extent to which the two are actually inextricably intertwined. To conclude, I have shown that both markets and machines are ultimately founded on human beliefs. The Dark Mountain Manifesto observes that civilizations are basically sets of beliefs. It cites Joseph Conrad's and Bertrand Russell's insights that human civilization, quote, is built on little more than belief, unquote and that the collapse of a civilization is more or less synonymous with the collapse of a belief system. Economists would agree about how crucial it is that we continue to believe in the magic of money. The financial meltdown on Wall Street in 2008 opened a crack in our belief system. The Dark Mountain Manifesto was written a few months later it concludes with this sentence, from the slopes of the dark mountain, it imagines, quote, we shall look back upon the pinprick lights of the distant cities and gain perspective on who we are and what we have become. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Al, for that you know, very wide range of stimulating and for someone on you know, the existential sort of response options, mm. I put myself on the optimist and sure. I, I, as a technological optimist <laughs> and uh, obviously a blind faith in money, money and I'm reconsidering. I'm reconsidering that and that's what this, um, this lecture is all about, challenging profounding wisdoms about some of the assumptions and some of the magic we indeed buy into. And, uh, you know, I'm going to invite questions to the, from the floor, but um, I'm going to first invite um, Avi, uh, my colleague, um, who I've been uh, preparing this lecture um, with, who has been leading our reading group and preparing us for this, this special occasion, who is going to help take the questions. So over to you, Avi, for ten minutes of questions, and, and then we will conclude. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alf. Just uh, briefly... Uh, <coughs> give everyone the awareness that leading up to uh, your very interesting talk today, we've, uh, quite a large group of us spread out amongst this audience have been reading uh, the book over the last month. Um, and so tomorrow uh, we'll be going in depth with that uh, in person with us. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And if you're interested in that, the details will come up afterwards. But before that, um, any questions? Raise your hand. Microphone. Thank you. While we're waiting, yeah. I'll, I'll quickly ask um, a question, seeing as we came from um, the material embodiment of uh, two sides of something which are, have some feedback between them, seeing as a lot of what we're talking about is about mm. feedback mm. and lacking, <coughs> and also some tensions. Um, for you, from your perspective or um, from your wisdom of being around for quite a while in, within this subject, then there's also a tension between the feedback of analytically thinking about it um, and coming up with it and the, the dialectical relationship or lack of between a lot of people here being aware that they have um, results uh, around the rest of the world as, as to what they do, but then it doesn't go very much further in how they then uh, put that into some feedback system of, of how to relate to a global, another feedback <coughs> dimension. So how do you tackle that question yeah. yourself? I, I want to begin by saying I'm sorry for being such a party spoiler. I mean, the, the, I can see your joy of this, this new building and I share it with you. <laughs> I, I, I'm not as pessimistic as I may sound, you know. Uh, I, I, what I was really trying to say was that I think anthropology has a real and very critical mission to fulfill. Because uh, no matter how much we love this, this discipline of anthropology and we love our projects, we love our field work and so on, uh, I think the, the, the most important thing we can do, uh, not only in anthropology but in the humanities in general, is to try to understand ourselves, is to try to understand modernity. And I think anthropology is uni uniquely you know, position to be able to, to, to look uh, in a detached way at our own society. Uh, now, I, I think I escaped your, your question there, but you, you put it very complexly. Could you rephrase it a bit, a bit okay, more simply? In a, in a simple sense, and then we'll take this lady's question. Oh, okay. There, there's, yeah. a, a, there's also a, no feedback between what one thinks about and what one does. There's oh, another yes. detachment there. Okay. And so you're asking me what I do personally no. with these thoughts? But, but I've been a farmer for the last 40 years. I've been raising sheep and beef cows. I grow potatoes. I have a huge vegetable garden. Uh, okay. Is, does that answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes, yes. And yes. Um, I was interested, it made me think of a family incident some years ago, um, where my daughter on a, 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 a series of travels managed to get herself locked in the toilet, and she was very small at the time. 
and there was no key I could use, and there was nobody I could pay, but I did get a coin and managed to twiddle it in the lock of the car. And it isn't magic. Yes. Um, no, it's it, it isn't a technological. Well, she thought it was magic. It yeah. gave me a good five years more of being parentally infallible. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't lasted to now. She's 18 now. Um, and, but it is really a technological solution that's based on knowledge and understanding. It's a solution that's based on human instincts for busking with whatever is to hand. So I wondered in, in what you have to say, what do we do with human creativity mm. and mm. busking mm. that isn't based on technology or, or, or commerce? Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, the first point I would like to say is that I usually say that this, this applies until the invention of the slot machine. <laughs> because then, of course, coins can be used as technology as well. And you managed very well with that door. <laughs> By the way, I've been in completely the same situation with my grandchild that is locked in. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. Um, but uh, knowledge, yes. Isn't that the way we usually think about technology? That technology is based on the ingenuity of the engineers. It's, it's in, in their mind. And there's some kind of magical, subjective understanding of the world that opens up like uh, doors to the steam engine and jumbo jets and whatever. Um, but my argument is that we have to complement that understanding of the technological phenomena. It's not just about thinking. It's not just about revealing new possibilities. It's about terms of trade in the world system. And I mean, just to give you an example, the steam engine, I think, would have been well, of course, you could invent it, you can build a few, but it wouldn't have revolutionized England the way it did if you didn't have slavery on the cotton plantations. It was part and parcel of that world system. The steam engine is unthinkable, actually. The Industrial Revolution is unthinkable without slavery, <coughs> which is a rather amazing implication. And it, it, does, it goes against the grain of our general conception of technology as being simply human progress. Uh, and I'm not against human progress. I just think that we really need to understand now that people are saying that by the end of the century, much of the planet may be uninhabitable. You know, it may be high time for us to rethink our categories, to rethink technological progress, to rethink economics, to rethink trade, to rethink money, most of all. And we can do it. Uh, so I'm an optimist, like you. I want to, I want to underscore that. Even if I quoted the Dark Mountain uh, manifesto several times, I am more optimistic than they are. I think we can do it. Yes? Um, yeah. I, I enjoyed the talk. I love food for reflection here. I just thought, um, what were your thoughts on uh, recent comments by Stephen Hawkins about how technology is one of the biggest threats to our sort of... Um, um, I, I didn't... I, I missed that. So, so basically, uh, yeah, there's a big uh, exposition on technology. And uh, he's been exposing how uh, technology is probably one of the greatest concerns that we should have in terms of the future of society. I, I, have, to I have to find it. That, that's very interesting. Yes, it's yeah. Because yeah. artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, but it's technology. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's linked to technology. So it's artificial intelligence is one of the greatest concerns for the future of society. Mm. I mean, like robotics, evolution of robotics. And he was uh, worried about what technology yeah, would do. And going to let loose and, and, and sort of uh, go loose control, basically. It's interesting coming from a person who is so 100% reliant on technology. As you Absolutely. Yeah. But I just said, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, no. it's, 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 it's very sort of, um, yeah. well, uh, yeah, I, I, artificial I'm intelligence is, is technology, like the sort of forefront of technology now, and, and, and sort of all this discussion about technology is, is leading society to that. Yeah. And Actually, this morning I had a talk with M Miguel here about technology and all these future technologies, and I, I, I think we should have, we should maintain a world system perspective on technology. I mean, household robots and self-navigating cars and artificial intelligence are not things that everybody's going to be sharing. I mean, we're seven and a half billion people. They're obviously going to be part of a very uh, <coughs> privileged minority of the global population. Uh, so we have to think of technology as intrinsically distributed. And that is completely what, you know, in line with my argument on the terms of trade and so on. So, so rather than worrying about what's artificial intelligence going to do to humanity, you might think of 
how are we going to see to it that everybody benefits from this? And I think that's the million dollar question for anthropology. Mm -hmm. To conclude, do we have any more questions? From Joao, um, any other questions? We'll take them all together. Then to conclude. Thank you very much. It was very fascinating to hear you. I, I wanted to ask you, um, how do you see the possibility of actually spreading your message? Because, for example, I saw recently with the Paradise Papers, mm -hmm. that suddenly an enormous instrument of political mm -hmm. conviction, because it, it just opened a, a, a door that we sort of knew was there, but people really didn't believe in that science, and suddenly they can believe in it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my question to you is, um, it does have to do with the constitution of noise. Uh, where silence often hides <coughs> what you are saying, the relationship between technology and money. Mm. And how can we improve on that? How can, for example, anthropology work on that? Can we yeah. just take also a question from Tom? <coughs> yeah. Shout it out. Yes, sir. Um, I, I am very much intrigued and indeed support your idea that anthropology has uh, and indeed should has a special role in examining further and critiquing the conditions of modernity. But does anthropology not also have a role in particularizing it as well, realizing that there are differences mm. in people situated in modern contexts mm. and different ideas that, uh, that come out of modernity as well? Mm. Yeah. Okay, can I take those two questions now? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I agree completely that noise is a problem, <laughs> and there's a lot of noise, um, and uh, uh, I, I really don't know how to handle it. I, I, I sometimes tell myself that, well, my message, whatever it is, is not going to be heard, uh, because there's just so much else going on, not only in anthropology, but in, in people's minds. Um, uh, on the other hand, I, I do have a feeling that given the financial crisis in 2008 and the likelihood that a lot of people are considering that we'll have even more severe crisis in the future, there will be questions raised that I think some of us are trying to respond to already today about money, about the metabolism of the world and so on. So uh, I guess that's... Uh, it's strange to be optimistic about a pessimistic message, but I have a feeling that we really have to go to the bottom with our own categories, and I literally mean the bottom, uh, before we can start re reshaping our understanding of, of what's, what's been happening over the past three centuries. Um, but certainly noise is a problem. Uh, in response to your question, yeah, it's, it's a great question about particularities. I mean, one of the things that drew me to anthropology was precisely my interest in the local, in the particular. And I mentioned before that I had spent 40 years as a farmer, and I still stay on that farm that my wife and I moved to when we were 23. And to us, the particular life world that we have there with our neighbors, uh, the animals, the trees, the, the landscape, it's very, very particular. And I would say that doing that, moving out there, is in itself a protest against modernity. Because modernity is precisely about disregarding the particular, about universalizing, making things exchangeable, interchangeable. Um, sociologists argue that you know, it's based on the idea of money, of universal interchangeability. Uh, so I think uh, we have every reason to, to uh, um, endorse and advocate uh, a resurgence of the particular. Um, and uh, my idea is that, you know, it could be done very much through a reorganization of, of the way money operates, but that's another lecture, so I won't get into that. No, it's not another lecture, it's another seminar tomorrow. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> because, <laughs> because we know you have the answer. All right, right. We know you have the answer, but I think it is the, the right moment after, you know, a very erudite, uh, you know, lecture covering you know multiple areas 
you know, to, to say thank you very much with the benefits of all that energy. In a sense, you have been our energy slave to you. Um, you know, a, you know, a great contribution to you know our discussions in the school, and particularly when you think about in certainly the UK, we talk a lot about global challenges, global challenge research, and how we link our work in anthropology and conservation to global challenges and how a world system perspective can fit into that and consider the kind of inequalities and injustices around that. And I think uh, you provide some of the key to that. Thank you very much. And so I want to say thank you on behalf of school for coming on this sort of double occasion and for us all to put our hands together one more time for our And, and, and just finally, if you are interested in continuing the conversation, tomorrow we go to the building, seminar room one, we do have a post show discussion, elaborating and discussing these ideas. There's also a, a, a seminar after that in the morning, run by the uh, CDCB of the, of the department, um, and uh, which is in many ways actually connected to some of the things that Al said around all the local, sustainable, socially political systems group food. And you are welcome to come for it, but make a note of the, the room. Jefferson yeah, Building, similar room one. Thank you very much. Well done. Well done. Yes, it went all right, didn't it? it went very well. well done, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. The microphone's on the, just the, in the entrance, it's on the reception. It's on the desk? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, can you special meeting? Yeah. You've got the keys for Which one? The new meeting. Um, I forget, the, uh, I guess the keys for the keys. Right, it's alright. No, it's alright. Um, I've locked the back door, like the slide door. So, it could be... The back, yeah. So you've got... Do you want to show about the back door? Like the... Back door, like the Right. So yeah, if people just get in the swipe card, yeah. this should be good. And you should be able to get this in the front. Yes, yeah. Um, and then the problem is in cabinet security of the keys. I've got a set of keys which are very much the best one they go. But I guess we'll call it. Thank you for everything you've done, I really appreciate it. See you later. Oh, the client's in my office. <laughs> <laughs> might, that, that might be able to wait. <laughs> Right, thank you for all your help. Thank you. And I, I managed to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Deciding whether to like run now and go and get some food or whether to wait for people to make a general movement. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Abby will be the one who, who's also in the room. Alright, cool. Well, I'm just going to get my speech from office. I'll see you guys around. Uh, yeah, the I'll, be in the I'll come over to yeah. Um, the, the, the programmers of the car had a uh, the 